Um, is it okay if you just jump in? Yep, no worries. All right. Thanks. I'll just get going. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, talking to you about crime mineralogy. Which, um, see how that goes. Um, so, yeah, so um, I didn't even get very far, but um, this is my outline of my talk. Um, as I said before, I'm a crystallographer. And uh, I thought I'd also tell you a little bit about how we take powder diffraction data and turn it into crystal structures as well. So um, I really like patterns. It's something that um, I've really enjoyed um, for a long time. I knit a bit and things like this. And um, I was thinking once about where my enjoyment of patterns came from. And um, as, as Garrick said, I, I grew up in England, um, just to the east of London. And I used to ride the um, underground all the way into um, my, my grandparents lived right at the end of the district line, which is the long green line if you've ever looked at the tube maps and used to go and then the other end of it is the natural history museum which was the place with all the cool minerals and the rocks and things um, so you can see a pattern there already and um, I used to spend it's about 45 stops from Upminster through to South Kensington and I used to stare at the um, pattern seats and sit, or sit there and work out what the um, repeating unit of the pattern was um, later, I actually went as an undergraduate to London, and I was delighted to find that every tube line has a unique um, pattern. You can see a proper nerd going on here. And so I sat there and through my undergrad worked through all the different units of the, um, of the patterns. So it turns out that um, what I learned in my fourth year of my undergraduate is actually that, oops, sorry, um, this isn't too different to being a crystallographer and essentially um, that's what I do now for a job um, but instead of doing it on seat covers of, of tube trains I take the um, three-dimensional um, diffraction patterns that we get off of all sorts of, of, of any crystalline material and, uh, and then I'm able to work out the, the crystal structure from that. But even if I can't work out the crystal structure just being able to get the Bragg scattering from that, um, even looking and tracking that as terms of different temperatures and things like this, that can also give us a lot of information and I'll talk to you a bit about that later. So behind me, for instance, is the diffraction pattern of triparmitin, which is a very, um, it's a long chain fatty acid, it's an important one because it's one of the ones that you find in chocolate. So um, where am I actually these days? Um, so I'm based in Australia at the Australian Centre for Neutron Scattering. And this is part of ANSTO, which stands for the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation. And we're one of the government science agencies in Australia. Um, you might have more likely have heard of CSIRO. They're, they're a little bit more famous than us. Um, we actually run Australia's only nuclear reactor. Um, and it's a research reactor, so it's not a power reactor. And we mainly run it for medical isotopes, but we also have a number of neutron instruments um, sort of attached to it. And I'll talk a bit about them. So ANSDO has recently become sort of the, the running of the big facilities in Australia. So um, for like in, in America, where you have like NIST and APS and the, the Berkeley, the um, advanced light source in Berkeley. Um, and Australia, we have the Australian synchrotron. We have a center of acceleration study. Um, um, oh, Centre of Accelerator Science, and we also have the Australian Centre for Neutron Scattering. So this is sort of a, an additional play thing that um, ANSTO has sort of moved into. And as you can see, we're sort of located just to the south of, um, of Sydney, sort of the airports here in Botany Bay, and then there's the CBD there. So you can sort of just picture where we are, and we're sort of just covered in trees everywhere. So we're very much buried in the bushland out here. So as I mentioned that we've got um, uh, about 15 instruments that come off the nuclear reactor and you already probably noticed the slightly cute thing is that we name all of ours off of um, after Australian animals. So I'm actually technically a wombat scientist and I've known and I'm also run echidna and these are our two powder powder diffraction instruments although wombat is able to do quite a lot more as well. And then each of these instruments will look at different length scales and different um, types of materials um, from our big instruments, which are like our small angle scattering, through to Dingo, for instance, which is our, our instrument, uh, our imaging instrument. 
So just to give a bit of an idea of how um, we analyze our powder diffraction, so we throw neutrons and you can actually do this with x-rays and on one back we actually get a two-dimensional image, so this is like the two-dimensional image we get, so we can actually look at samples that aren't perfect powders as well. And one of the things we do, and hopefully it will come up at some point, is that we actually collapse that that down to a one-dimensional trace and that's our powder diffraction pattern and one of the things that we sometimes go on to do after that is then stack them up as we change the temperatures so in in my case it, you know, there's a nice example of that so that's the I've collapsed there the the one-dimensional the two-dimensional image to this one-dimensional pattern and then I can go on and the the fitting of this is something that um, is really quite straightforward that any um, any sort of laptop can cope with without too many problems, although tripomitin is quite a complicated structure actually. Um, so I mainly these days scatter neutrons, but of course you can undertake diffraction with x-rays and with electrons as well. Um, I don't personally do much electron scattering, it's, it's not so useful for these sort of cryomineralogical materials, but um, x-rays um, we do a lot in terms of because they're much higher resolution so we're able to really find the structures from them but then neutrons are brilliant because um, x-rays um, scatter dependent on the amount of electrons in the in the cloud um, so hydrogen carbon oxygen all of the the main elements are not actually particularly well scattering and so um, one of the really, really nice things is that um, neutrons actually do scatter much better from these elements. And so we were able to get a lot more information from them sometimes. So it's sort of a nice pairing of both of them. Um, so, so that's a bit of an introduction of what I do. Um, I think this is not going to be a controversial statement, hopefully. The solar system is an awesome place. And one of the things that has inspired me for, for many, many years is quite how different it is as we go whoops, from the terrestrial planets all the way through to the gas giants and all the um, um, icy moons. And as you can see, I'm, I'm actually uh, reminded of this quite a lot. Um, this picture was taken by my partner. And uh, these are just pictures that we can, well, not just pictures, he does a lot of work to, to make them this pretty. But these were all taken from our backyard in Sydney. But um, as, as Garrick uh, said, that I've really focused into ocean worlds. And one of the things I really like about them is how diverse they are, um, how different their landscapes are, but and, and how this is driven by different materials that make up those surfaces. So from the bright spots that we see on Ceres to the recent reports of glowing Europa, the lakes on Titan and the glaciers of Pluto. Um, these are all happening, as we all know, with, with materials that, that are not the traditional sort of rocks that we would expect these sorts of effects happening on, on our terrestrial planets. And, um, and there's a lot of um, knowledge still to be gained about how those, those materials actually work. So we've recently dubbed this sort of study of these materials as cryomineralogy. So I sort of been stumbling around mineralogy for a number of years. And um, those of you who are maybe not um, familiar of it, it's, the sub it's a subject of geology that specializes in sort of the chemistry, crystal structure and physical including optical properties of minerals and mineralized artifacts, which is good because it covers opal, which is not, and from my <laughs> my two cents, not a mineral because it hasn't got a crystal structure. Um, so one of the things that we've, um, um, so a natural place to publish a lot of this work is mineralogy journals, um, because essentially that's what we're trying to do. But we sort of bumped into this a few times because mineral actually only refers to a naturally occurring material on Earth. And so um, a lot of these materials that we've studied uh, wouldn't solidify necessarily on Earth, but of course do on the outer solar system and are sort of very important in terms of sculp sculpting them. So recently the American mineralogist has actually redefined their journal. They now call themselves the uh, Journal of Earth and Planetary Materials. So I feel like we're having some headway, but, um, and I'm not sure I'm too worried about all of these materials I'm looking at getting mineral names as such. But the important thing, the interesting thing is that um, though we go from um, all of these materials can do sort of the traditional things that we see uh, materials, anisotropic thermal expansion, complicated crystal structures, substitution and things like this. 
but they have a bonus in that they can actually make um, um, do many other things that the traditional silicate minerals that um, traditional mineralogists look at can't. So these are uh, phenomena such as plastic crystals, order disorder transitions, pyroelectricity and polymerization. So all of these are, are processes that can happen with these small molecules that don't really, that do not happen with traditional minerals. And so I'll, um, um, I'll touch on a few of these properties as we go through. So I've mentioned a lot about them in general terms, but what actually are these materials? So around the asteroid belt, we're talking about carbonates and sulfate hydrates and some small organic molecules. When it comes to the Galilean moons, water ice, ice-1H becomes very important. In fact, probably amorphous ice and maybe high pressure ice is further down as well. Chloride, chloride hydrates, so NaCl plus water, have become very important, and sulfate hydrates, and I'll talk a bit about some of the work I've done there. And then when we get to Titan, I'll, I'll talk a lot more in detail about Titan, but we've recently sort of um, defined them into three different type of materials, so molecular solids, co-crystals, and gas hydrates. And then as we go further out to the Pluto and the Kuiper Belt objects, we have things like nitrogen, methane and carbon monoxide that um, become solid and are the sort of the materials that shape the surfaces there. So how do we go about actually understanding this? And I've talked a little bit more about, I talked a bit, introduced a lot about the technique that I've been using recently, the x-rays and the neutrons, but I work a lot with the um, IC Minerals Group at JPL who do a lot of Raman as well. And so this is sort of our workflow where the Raman often um, will discover new structures or indicate that something would be there. And then we follow up with X-ray and neutron scattering experiments. And then sometimes it's sort of the, some of the, the uh, topics sort of take their own form and, and we'll do a bit more different types of neutron scattering, some inelastic work and things like this to really drill down and find the most that we can. So um, in terms of a sort of workflow, the first job, the first job is always to find the crystal structure. Without a crystal structure, you're sort of flailing around quite a bit. Um, of course, we're very indebted to theorists in, in, um, in instructing us and, and helping us find what, what might be interesting to look at. Um, but the problem is a lot of these materials is they are often disordered and that makes it a bit of a challenge to um, model these, these systems. Um, and then we start to look at the physical properties. And then lastly, we're trying to look at the mechanical properties as well. So trying to put these in context of the, um, of the surfaces. So um, as a first stop, uh, how we're doing for time, yeah, doing all right, uh, we'll stop at Europa. Um, and this is sort of the work that I've sort of started when I moved to Australia and um, started to sort of wander a bit. And the surface of Europa is obviously an interesting and, and slightly dangerous place. And, um, and although we um, are very interested in it because of the, the potential life bearingness of the ocean yeah. below, our biggest clue to the composition of the ocean is, of course, the surface. And then of course, there's a number of the theories that have come as to what the um, what the materials actually are and what are the processes driving those materials. And there's sort of like these three main theories are the materials. So we have a dominant of water ice, but of course, as you can see there, there's a lot of a um, lot of materials there that aren't water ice. You can just see that from the the color. And, and the way that this color is also um, correlated with things like the cracks there as well. So there's the big theory that a lot of it is the radiolysis of iosulfur, so sulfate that comes from um, ios, um, ios volcanoes that smacks into the surface and actually starts grabbing hydrogen and oxygen from the water, becomes sulfuric acid, and then to form hydrates from that. Recently, we've heard a lot about radiation damage that could be things like um, sodium chloride that undergo radiation damage that causes color centers. But then, of course, we've got this idea that we could get material from an ocean. And, and as we've now, Hubble has now confirmed that we see geysers from um, Europa, that that's definitely a potential process as well. So you can sort of divine these two into, into both exogenic and endogenic, um, the radiation damage of endogenic materials being a combination of two. And this is sort of something that's really fascinated me for a wee while. One of the things that started this was actually reading that sulfuric acid octahydrate, which um, is, was meant to be one of the most dominant materials and still is a recent 
um, reanalysis of the, the Galileo NIMS data sort of again suggested that sulfuric acid octahydrate will be a major, for, major material on the surface. But when I actually looked at the literature back in 2011 when I started this, there was actually papers that published that suggested that sulfuric acid octahydrate didn't actually exist, which was slightly surprising. So me as a, a new postdoc at the Australian Synchrotron at that time, not having a great deal of money, I was like, well, if I just take some water and some sulfuric acid, I can cool it down and see what crystallizes. I, I, I say I didn't have much money, but I did have a synchrotron beamline at my disposal. And so I did that and uh, was able to find the, the, the sulfuric acid octahydrate, looked at the structure. But the, one of the things you can see from here you know, on this top image is you can see this is a typical diffraction pattern I got. I did a number of com compositions. Um, but you can see there's some missing peaks. So the green line is my model from the sulfuric acid octahydrate. And there's some those black ones that aren't being modeled suggest that there's something else there, that there's a different phase. And playing around with the, um, the compositions, and you can see that we one of the nice things about the synchrotron, we get very high resolution data, so we can go forward and solve the structure, is I discovered that there's actually another form, um, sulfuric acid hexahydrate, so slightly less water in the crystal structure. Um, and um, this has probably been one of the reasons that people have struggled to um, to pull out the um, to pull out the the spectral data because probably whenever you're crystallizing octahydrate, you're also getting the um, hexahydrate as well. And one of the reasons behind this is actually how similar the crystal structures are. Um, they both have the same layers all the way through them. So these sort of water layers come through, sort of put like dotted lines that show the hydrogen bonding through them. Uh, I always describe this one, sulfuric acid octahydrate, as a peanut butter sandwich, where the sulfate is like the peanut butter. And sulfuric acid hexahydrate as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, where it actually has hydroniums within the structure as well. But the nice thing about them is that we can start to think of these and somebody once suggested I call them this and I didn't go that far as like they're like the phyllosilicates, they're like the, the layered clay structures that we see on Earth to some extent. So someone suggested I call them star clay, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Maybe planet, planetary or icy clay would be uh, more appropriate. And the thing is automatically you can see that if you've got a, a, a sort of lump of Europa, which is made out of some of its water ice, hexagonal water ice, which is actually really strongly bonded, um, it's quite uh, well, disordered, but can be really, really strong. Um, and versus these materials, which are more layered, you've automatically got a big change in their, um, their mechanical properties. And so that can drive um, potential formations on the surface there. We've taken this to the next sort of level and began to look at some of the other components. So um, magnesium sulfate hydrates and sodium sulfate hydrates uh, are um, both meant to be quite important on the surface as well. And these are thought to be um, um, coming from the ocean below and onto the top of the, the ice. And, um, and I've sort of started to break this down in terms of Lego bricks, in terms of how the crystal structures are put together, especially with magnesium sulfate hydrates. They have this very um, sort of um, octahedral unit going on there with the um, magnesium um, bounded to the six, um, six water atoms. And that's sort of a feature. Magnesium sulfate hydrates are known to have a, a number of forms. So everything from a monohydrate through to, uh, well, the 11 hydrate, which I can never remember, the, it's undecahydrate. And some of these actually have mineral names because they're found on Earth. So one of the um, things they did as an experiment was to start to think, well, if we do have these uh, magnesium sulfate hydrates and and, and sodium sulfate, but we'll just talk about magnesium sulfate. If we do have them on the surface, but they're then being, um, in, um, you get um, sulfuric acid adding to this from the exogenic. So what's happening when you mix endogenic and exogenic um, features, um, processes on Europa? Is this going to change? Is there going to be 
a dominant material come out or is this going to drive um, sort of mineral diversity on the surface so we looked at the ternary and we actually this I'll just show you sort of stepping through the diffraction of just one composition so there's just this composition here um, so we, we we crystallize it and we get sort of glass and water ice and then as we go up so this is each of these is what I've done here is I've stacked the diffraction patterns in terms of in terms of temperature up there we then get um, two hydrates of sulfuric acid form, but also a hydrate that I couldn't identify at the time. And then we, uh, one of those hydrates melts and then we get um, more ice coming in there. Here we've got two brand new hydrates form at this point as we're going up with temperature. So all it's doing is this sort of, this is just a mixture of magnesium sulfate, water and sulfuric acid. But you can see how many different materials are popping up. We, uh, we warm up again and we get um, magnesium sulfate 11, so that's the mirabolite structure, but yet again another new hydrate appears. And then again um, later on you can see that they've all got different melting temperatures, different physical properties, and this leaves us with just that one new hydrate. And the nice thing is because that left us with a pure pattern, we could go on and solve that. So the, the moral of that story was that um, it's all very well sort of analyzing the, the, the spectra from, from Galileo and from the European service in terms of sort of simple materials, just one hydrate or another. But in reality, um, we're likely to have a mixture of both exogenic and endogenic um, processes. And so those are really going to drive some mineral diversity on the surface of Europa. So that's a sort of a bit of a warning uh, system, but there's a lot of complicated and interesting um, structures to be found there. So stepping out, um, we'll go further to um, Titan. And um, a lot of my uh, work recently has been um, focused on what's going on in Titan and um, as probably many of you there know how interesting it is um, it's the largest moon in our solar system well it was nearly the largest moon unfortunately um, its atmosphere sort of inflated it a little bit and actually turns out Ganymede is about 50 kilometers a little bit bigger but one of the things that the Cassini mission has really uh, revealed is that um, it's a whole different chemical inventory and there's a massive um, um, uh, massive uh, potential for different chemicals going on and um, different planetary processes and, and as a result of that of course potential of astrobiology um, happening. I think Carl Sagan much once referred to um, Titan as a potential prebiotic chemical laboratory. Um, so one of the big um, surprising um, discoveries from Cassini was that um, water ice it wasn't as um, abundant as they thought and they really did think um, I think everyone expected it to be sort of like the Galilean moons and actually um, there's a lot of these um, um, smaller molecules um, carpeting across the surface. Now why is that? And that's because of that atmosphere again, which is principally methane and nitrogen, but you get, um, um, uh, they get radicalized by the, um, the solar wind and the energy from Saturn. And these cause um, bigger, um, bigger and bigger molecules to get formed as a result of this, and then they all rain down on the surface. And as you can see, there's a number of astrochemical models that sort of follow this through, and they've come up with different sort of um, uh, calculations for the flux on the surface but the the upshot is that there's this big list of molecules that we now think are on the surface and that are what are actually shaping the surface there so we went forward and started looking at what was known about so it's like we know a bit about the chemistry what about the materials and actually there's um, a really big database of chemical crystal structures called the Cambridge Structural Database it has over a million crystal structures but bizarrely I could only find about 50 maybe only 30, 30 to 50 that are relevant to Titan and through that I then went forward and sort of um, classified them a little bit in terms of what they could uh, they what they would be so we have everything from sort of gas hydrates on the surface there so the gas hydrates are those um, those water clathrate structures and we think that they're very much at the sort of bottom of this layer where the the water has integrated with those hydrocarbons and you get those hydrocarbons forming in those cages there we then also have the co-crystals and I'll talk a bit more about them and then of course there's the likelihood that these um, 
these phases will exist um, pure on the surface as well, so as molecular solids. So uh, a lot of this work was started by the um, the planetary ices group at the at JPL, and this is where I first got involved. Um, and they were um, on the hunt for what could be an evaporite mineral on Titan. And that came off sort of the radar imaging from Titan that showed that not only did you have little lakes, but you also had dried up lake beds as well. And I, I like to point out that these are quite analogous to what we can see as you fly across Australia as well. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately with Australia, you know, I couldn't land the plane, but I could actually walk up and and grab the, a bit of this and take it to my lab and work out what it is. Obviously, we can't do that on Titan just yet, although quite looking forward to Dragonfly getting there. Um, but of course, the temperature on the surface of Europe uh, of Titan is around minus 180 degrees C. So this isn't going to be a water evaporate. So what can sort of evaporate and leave behind a residue? And uh, the, the group there had looked at benzene. So here are some beautiful benzene crystals. And when they flood it with ethane, which is of course a known material in the lakes of Titan, you can see that there's quite, just by looking at it, quite a, a big change. Those crystals get sort of gobbled up and broken up. And then they looked at this with the Raman scattering and saw some big shifts in the, in the Raman as well. And then um, they came um, across to Australia and we recreated that same experiment but in a diffraction sense so this is the simple benzene structure we add in the ethane and suddenly whoo big change and uh, a new form there and this data again was from the Australian synchrotron were so good that we were able to solve that crystal structure and it's a, a benzene ethane three to one co-crystal the really beautiful thing is is this really lovely framework of benzene with ethane living um, down the channels and one of the lovely things um, that I got really excited about is a group based at the Southern Methodist University in Texas have actually found uh, another one of the family. Um, in this case, it's a nitrile that lives down the channels there. And so we've already got a potential sort of framework family going on and we're going forwards and trying to find a few more. But of course, um, um, Morgan Cable and, uh, and Chuan Vu have carried on screening for more and more of these co-crystals and been very, very <laughs> successful. Uh, we now know of about, um, well, six for sure that we have diffraction patterns and things for, um, but there's a couple of others that we're beginning to theorize. We're working a little bit with theorists on this as well. And even then we're able to start um, even um, grouping these co-crystals. So these are two component um, materials. So we have from layers, we have chains, and we have frameworks. So we're already seeing a big change in their crystal structures, but of course this impacts onto their physical properties as well. And I'll just say we've, we've just published a nice paper in Accounts of Chemical Research about all of this. So yeah, so that's all great. And I've here I've got sort of a two uh, a sort of graph showing the, the sheer potential of this work. So along here is the all of those materials that we we that the astrochemists and now actually the astronomers are more and more thinking are on the surface. And then in the boxes I've sort of put where we know the density of a co-crystal between the two of them. And then of course in down in red is this the pure structures. Hang on a moment you can see that there's some missing information there. I would have thought by now in 2021, we would know the crystal structures of all these simple molecules. Well, it turns out that we don't. And in some cases, there's actually a good reason for this. Um, things like um, hydrogen ions, isocyanide is more of a sort of astrochemical model and um, uh, molecule. And is one of those things you can't just buy from Sigma Aldrich or, or Merck and, uh, and put in your laboratory. And some of them are quite unstable on our, on our lab bench timescales. But some of them, propodiene, propine, butene, butadiene, are all actually quite accessible. And I'm still surprised that no one's ever just sort of crystallized them <laughs> and seen what happens. So that's a sort of low hanging fruit and one of those things that I've been doing with our neutron diffraction because we don't necessarily need really high resolution diffraction to to solve these and I should also say um, some of you who might know a bit about neutron scattering are like oh surely she's using the deuterated equivalents I don't because um, Wombat is such an awesome instrument and I'll show a good example of that that I actually can use hydrogenous materials with it and I should say that even ones with published crustal structures have been um, a bit a bit interesting. Um, 
I've, I've put here the example of acrylonitrile. Um, acrylonitrile is um, sort of a very nice, simple molecule. And it was um, predicted back in 2015 to start being able to form membranes. But it's interesting, and we'll, I'll come back to that in a minute as to why that is a bit interesting. So I've actually been going through and doing uh, probably a little bit of stamp collecting, but filling in those blanks. So we've recently struck, uh, solved the structure of butadiene and propyne. Interesting butadiene, this is a bit of a crystallography nerd thing. It was actually first as, um, at least suggested, or at least the unit cell was discovered. So the box was suggested back in 1940 by um, somebody who actually worked at the lab that I worked in briefly in London. Um, but it's interesting that we've actually found that it's a smaller unit cell. And so it's a little bit more simpler to describe. So there's a lot more of, of this work to come and it's quite nice. Um, um, the crystallographers um, as a group really love it. It sort of harks back to some of our history and, and things like that as well. But as I said, even for known crystal structures, so acetonitro is probably one of the most used um, most used solvents in any lab. And there are num numerous crystal structures in that database where it's sort of there as a co-crystal or it's there as a co-former as well. Um, but we looked at it pure and again, they already knew the crystal structures of it, sort of monoclinic and orthorhombic crystal structures. We did the neutron. Neutrons are generally with bigger samples. Everything was kind of expected. But when our honours student, um, James, went to do it on the x-rays with um, a smaller capillary, he found that as he cooled down, he actually got the high temperature form persisting at low temperature. And then when he warmed up, he would get the low temperature form and then he'd get a mixture of them all. And so what he discovered was that actually um, we've got um, the potential of uh, phase trapping. And again, this is a lot, this is seen in earth minerals. Um, so cristobalite, which is actually a high temperature form of, uh, of silica, of, of quartz that cools down um, too quickly. So um, a volcano erupts, it cools down um, too quickly and it becomes metastably trapped at our, our, our room temperature. And it's one of those things that we can um, use, as, you know, go out in the field and actually find and use it to sort of say, hey, there's probably been a volcano around here. So we've sort of suggested that this is a potential marker for, for Titan in that same context as well. And I mentioned about acrylonitrile because it, it forms those um, membranes and things. Um, we actually only know of one crystal structure of it. Um, and that crystal structure is very disordered. And it's actually this that's sort of gone on and um, people have used to, to form that membrane idea. Um, I would be a little cautious of that because um, that you don't really understand sort of the sort of energy landscape around that molecule in this sense so well. And so um, one of the things I've been trying to do is find the ordered form of this and be able to then work out if, um, if that would impact on our knowledge of those membranes. One of the things that I've discovered as we've done this, though, is that I think we get phase trapping again. So I actually think that this beta form, so this alpha, we've started naming it, this is alpha form is that same disordered high temperature form. We've discovered this beta form, which I believe is the low temperature form. But the, the awkward thing is we get the alpha form forming at the low temperatures as well. And the interesting thing is this has happened in our neutron diffraction data. So this is a much bigger sample. So with the acetonitrile, we hypothesized that the phase trapping was happening because of sort of a strain from this really tiny capillaries. The capillaries we use for that are only 0 0.3 millimeters. In this sense, this is both um, a disordered, um, disordered thing, whereas acetonitrile is not disordered. Um, but also it's happening on a, on a bigger sample. So the mechanism of this phase trapping is very different. So that's something that we've definitely got to um, delve into a bit more. So last stop, and I'll whiz through this a little bit to allow time for some questions, um, is a stopped by Pluto. And um, I've been, uh, as I imagine many of you were, absolutely fascinated when we saw those New Horizons images of all those beautiful glaciers on, on Pluto. And those glaciers, as we know, are mainly made out of nitrogen and methane. Now, for me, uh, nitrogen and methane are very um, interesting solids, um, especially methane. It's actually uh, the reason I'm 
shows it all a bit bonkers there is because um, it's actually in its solid phase, it's actually rotationally disordered and the same actually for um, nitrogen as well. These means actually, and I don't know if you've ever frozen a piece of nitrogen and stuck it on the bench, I have, it's like jelly. And so these are what we call plastic solids and they're quite unique and I don't think has really fully explained um, how they're going to work on a sort of mechanical rock situation just yet. But I noticed that we sort of didn't, um, no one knew the thermal expansion of, of nitrogen and methane sort of over the, um, the Pluto um, uh, seasonal variation and I should say that that's a relatively straightforward experiment for me to do and one of the reasons for that is because we've adapted sort of uh, these gas delivery sticks um, so these go into our cryostat they were originally designed to do gas dosing experiments for for matter organic frameworks so I've sort of appropriated them to do some planetary science and so it means that I can condense things like uh, methane and nitrogen all the way down to around five Kelvin or so without too many um, too much trouble. Um, and so um, I was able to look at methane and I again should say that this is hydrogenous methane. So we do get a larger background, which is why the data isn't going to be as pretty as the nitrogen data I'm going to just show you. But um, you're still able to track the unit cell and you can see that this jump here actually uh, equates to um, a phase transition that's known. And this is the phase two and then it jumps to phase um, one. So that's sort of less interesting in a way because that's not during um, over Pluto. Um, Pluto time, um, um, temperature scales, but um, nitrogen is perhaps a little bit more interesting because it does have a phase transition um, over sort of the seasonal variation of Pluto. And, um, and just in this work, we were the first to sort of classify that density change. Um, and you can see we go from the sort of disordered um, high temperature beta form to an ordered alpha form as we cool down. And actually, this is a sort of, uh, again, you'd have thought by now we should know what the crystal structures of the elements are. No. <laughs> um, it turned out when I collected this data, and I was actually quite surprised at how beautiful it was, that there was actually a long standing controversy on the crystal structure. It's, it's very subtle. It's sort of, it's around where these molecules are actually centered on the origin. Um, so the, the pervading structure had them sort of slightly off centered to the origin. And um, the structure that I've kind of proven it has to be is actually centered. It's actually quite important because if you have this uncentered structure, um, it actually imposes a sort of pyroelectric properties onto the nitrogen, which could have been very interesting. But unfortunately, uh, well, unfortunately, I don't know, fortunately for Pluto, um, we found that it's actually more the simple symmetric structure. And here's some of the in information as to why that is. And it comes down to there should be peaks here and here if it is the asymmetric structure. And there just isn't those peaks. Um, but one of the things that I thought it was interesting that this work sort of exposed was quite the contrast in density um, um, that uh, methane really isn't dense in any way compared to like nitrogen and water. And just here we've just sort of the, the, the thing we were able to show is how that density changes over the, the temperatures and also the disparity between them as well. So um, yeah, in this, um, hopefully summarize what I've talked about. Um, so hopefully I've convinced you all that cryominerology is a largely unexplored field. And so we're very much at the stage of just trying to find the crystal structures. And despite how simple the materials seem to be on first glance, there's an awful lot to do. And I talked a bit about Europa and showed how we think radiolysis and the, the both endogenic and exogenic processes have expanded the range of materials that we would expect on Europa. I've talked a bit about the upper atmosphere effects on Titan that would lead to a big inventory of, of molecular mineralogy. And lastly, you know, would a glacier on Pluto be good to ski on? Still got to work it out. It certainly would be wobblier than going into the slopes anywhere else. Um, with that, I'll in, uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Helen. I don't know if you can hear it, but there's clapping in the room. Yeah, cool. Thank you. I am hesitant to unmute things, but are there, I guess I've locked things, so we should be somewhat safe. Um, maybe if there are questions, someone could raise their hand in Zoom, and then I could unmute you to ask it. Um, Blake Rogers, is that someone? 
Okay. Okay, great. <laughs> Sorry, Blake. <laughs> um, okay, I'm trying to unmute you, Blake. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, great. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I was, uh, in, in regards to the acetonitrile and was it acrylonitrile? Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering, do you have like the ingot structure forming where you have uh, dendrites flowing into the surface or coming from the surface and going into the core of these? I don't know if you're doing it in a capillary tube or whatever, mm -hmm. but do you think that could be causing some of the high energy kind of, uh, or what would you call it? Um, this yeah, is the high, phase high tracking that we're seeing. Yeah, do you think that could be mm -hmm. something maybe? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so that's a, it's a good point, actually. So, yes, yeah, so the way we form these is that oh, I'll just bring back the 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 acrylonitrile work. Um, so with the, the x-rays, you're right, we have really small capillaries and we condense the material in. But sort of once we've condensed it in, we sort of keep it there. So um, which is why we thought that when we got the phase tramping in the acetonitrile, that it was coming because sort of like there was strain accumulating around the um, the, the 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 walls of the capillary, mm -hmm. and that the core of the capillary, the, the the sample there was less strained, and it was that that was causing the issue. Um, with the acrylonitrile, we're actually doing this in a large six millimeter um, vanadium can. And so um, there we don't think that strain's going to be occurring and stuff like that. But yeah, certainly, I mean, the powder diffraction, um, it looks pretty average. So like, as in, um, we don't see big texture changes. So I don't believe that there's like just one long crystal forming along it. Um, so which, as you're right, could, could definitely have formed things. I think we're still getting good powder averages of the thing. So yeah, I've definitely something to consider though. Perfect, thank you. I'm just going to go down in order here. Jake, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, um, first of all, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, this isn't really my sort of field, so I apologize if this is a really simple question, but um, you mentioned that they sort of had like this lookup table for all of these materials mm -hmm. that you were looking at, but then you said you were finding uh, like the discrepancies kind of between uh, when you were measuring. Does that mean that when you go through um, and you're trying to compare these, are you having to remeasure every single one of these materials to try and make sure that it's not actually something new, it's just something we never measured before, like that we should have seen already? Yeah, the, there's definitely a bit of that. So the Cambridge Crystal Structure Database, which is the one that I, I searched, it's, it's like, as I say, an inventory of about a million different crystal structures. But each of those crystal structures are only determined at particular conditions. So some of them in terms of pressure and some of them in terms of temperature. And uh, it's pretty common to have a lot of them, especially these sorts of materials, only determined at, I don't know, 130 Kelvin. Um, and that's because most crystallography labs that's where they run their cryostream and that's where they run. So not many labs, and this is one of the reasons we're, I'm finding um, differences, is sort of originally people only approached looking at these materials from a crystallographic um, sense. Sometimes there's curiosities. Um, there was a whole uh, group who looked at, they were interested in what would be weak interactions that hold crystal structures together. And actually they're the ones who discovered a number of the, um, the co-crystals that we look at, especially this one, the benzene, um, oh, what's that molecule, the long molecule? It's in torches, benzene acetylene. And that one is particularly weak and it's actually kind of amazing how it holds together and stuff. So part of a lot of the differences and the things that we're seeing is just that no one else has ever looked at them at varying temperatures because there wasn't the scientific motivation before. And, and even just looking at things at 90 Kelvin, which of course um, Titan is kind of nice. You always know how to dress for the weather there. Um, you know, even just the, because these materials are often very um, highly disordered, that difference between 130 Kelvin and 90 Kelvin can be the difference between an ordered and a disordered crystal structure. So yeah, it's sort of, I suppose the other thing is I would be, there's a big field of crystal structure prediction. And I've talked to a few of them uh, a couple of times about, well, why can't we just predict 
um, acrylonitrile and work out what it is. And they sort of, one of them went back and he threw back a load of potential crystal structures at me, threw back about 100 at me. And I think, again, it's that problem is the weak, um, the very subtle interactions that are causing um, causing um, there to be, you know, because they're so weak and so subtle, um, we don't necessarily have a handle on how they all work. So, yeah, there's a lot of work to do. Thank you so much. No worries. Excellent. Stephanie? Fantastic. Thank you so much for a nice talk. So I've got a couple of questions. I'll try to keep them quick. Um, you're mostly doing powder. I'm more familiar with single crystal myself. So I assume you're doing some sort of right veld refinement to take you from your powder structure to your predicted single crystal. I'm doing inverted commas in midair sort of thing. Have you done any of the back confirmation, grown some single crystals to confirm what you're seeing? Um not yet and i suppose the thing is yeah i mean my my sort of thing has always been to do the 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 to to do um structure solution from powders and i would sometimes yeah so we're doing reef felt ref refinement we often do simulated annealing to begin with to uh -huh. um to come up with some models and then we go forward and do the reef felt um, I sometimes would argue that uh, powder diffraction or, or crystal structures from powder diffraction could potentially be more representative of the bulk <laughs> than single crystal. Sure, sure. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're, we're certainly missing out on the really fine details and um, and certainly like hydrogen positions could be, especially in some of the really subtle things could be very important. So certainly, um, but we can go forward and, and 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 compare the structures but i mean i did i did do a nice refinement of the acetonitrile structure because uh -huh. those ones both of those have been determined from single crystal sure, sure. and then when i did the refinement they matched up really nicely so um yeah it's not something that i the reason i probably would grow the single crystals just because I'm, I'm a bit lazy it's a bit <laughs> to grow single crystals <laughs> i would probably do it um and I would use one of our neutron, we have a neutron single crystal instrument called Koala, um, mm. just to really, you know, just to really understand how these these monocles are, are, are holding together and things like that. So that that's probably going to be a motivation down the track. Sure. Uh, any thoughts on looking at tholins or something like that? The difficulty I find with tholins is, is I've, from reading quite a bit about it, is it's hard to pin down what they actually are. Yeah, that's why I thought the powder mm. might be the way to go with that. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Certainly, I would be fascinated to 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 get a sample of of some of the work that uh, some of the tholin samples that people do, and just to to look at it and to mm. see what crystallizes out. It could be that a lot of it is kind of glassy, amorphous, uh -huh, but uh -huh. um, we could still get some, you know changes and structural changes out of that i would imagine that it would be a mixture that there yeah. would be some crystalline phases some amorphous phases and we could fingerprint those if, if nothing else that actually would be a really nice sort of aps mail-in is to put it in a capillary and send it there and see what happens there you go thanks sir no, no worries thanks anna go ahead Okay, there we go. Um, I, I thought it came up saying I had been unmuted, but I guess I was just allowed to unmute myself. Um, yeah, that was a really cool talk. Um, Jennifer and I are gonna be looking into this phase trapping a little bit more. Um, awesome. But um, I, I have a, a pretty simple question. Um, I think I missed it. So with the uh, sulfuric hexa and octahydrates, um, with the uh, with what you had determined, is there an indication that it is on Europa, or are we are we off off the octahydrate and it's the hexa, or yeah? <laughs> I I don't think we know yet, um, because okay. and I am it's kind of bad on me is I actually got um, an ear infrared spectrometer to try and do a fingerprint of it but I don't think anyone's actually collected a fingerprint of the hexahydrate yet and one of the difficulties is it's always mixed um, it, it never occurs on its own so being able to find a sort of 
definitive fingerprint that this is sulfuric acid hexahydrate and this is sulfuric acid octahydrate is going to be really really challenging and it's one of the reasons that drove there's a whole paper of does it does sulfuric acid octahydrate even exist and mm -hmm. and that's from spectral data in like it's back in 2008 or so and it's just because um they were getting confused because i'm pretty sure they were getting both phases crystallizing out so yeah it i suppose it just goes to show that um we need to consider this um it's we've got libraries of, uh, of spectral data but we do need to consider the the potential of uh, of metastable phases that will be there and we can't necessarily pull them out um yeah it's certainly something to talk to the the spectral people about cool thank you i should say i've actually got nims data behind me this is nims <laughs> took a picture of um, of australia and the reason i really like it is hang on if, if which is this side is because you can see it took this picture at fifty thousand kilometers and you can see that fuzzy blob there that's the great mm -hmm. barrier reef that, that, oh, that you wow. can see it's the calcium carbonate for it so i really love this image <laughs> we are at nice. five o'clock but jorge has had his hand up for a while so we'll let him go and then i'll cut it off at that point um, I will just say that Helen is wonderful and really friendly. So if you have questions, you should send her an email and yeah, start up a conversation. Please do. I'll just leave up my contact. <laughs> okay, Jorge, go ahead. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I very much appreciate your talk. And also, I wanted to comment on how much I appreciate you sharing some of your previous talks on YouTube. It's helped me out quite a bit. And I've come to enjoy this very much uh, looking into... Uh, the stuff that you've shared with us today. And I wanted to ask, uh, regarding the Excel spreadsheet, the one that says quite a lot of work still to do, <laughs> I thought I remember hearing that you had mentioned in a previous talk that one of the disadvantages, or well, one of the issues was that um, even if we were to find values for those missing cells in you know the values uh, in the spreadsheet, <laughs> that we would still be missing the crystallographic structure or the crystal structure. And I was wondering if you would comment on whether or not it would be useful for theoreticians to have artificial intelligence type of algorithms that would highly, you know, with higher accuracy predict the properties that we were seeking, if, if that would be something that would be useful or not. Awesome. Oh, this is a great question. And um, yeah, so I'll bring up that again. So yeah, the numbers that I've got in there, I, I didn't explain particularly well, sorry. <laughs> They're all the, the densities of the, the, the different materials at, I think I normalized them all to be 100 Kelvin um, and, and standard atmospheric pressure. Um, and just knowing the crystal structures would enable us just to fill in all those numbers. That's um, sort of like one of the key sort of um, great bits of information. But yeah, um, that's been one of the, the and certainly with some of those astrochemical um, um, molecules, ones that are going to be really challenging both experimentally and safety to do experiments on hydrogen isocyanide. Um, and it's a very simple structure. So um, I know the, the crystal structure prediction people are using things like machine learning in order to try and predict structures. Um, but the, there's a lot of challenges going on there. And I should say, yeah, and, and the point you pick up on is it's sort of my, my hope would be that once we know more about how the pure structures are, are holding together, then we can use that information, the sort of the intermolecular forces for each one that's typical for each one. We can then feed that into things like AI to um, into crystal structure prediction to be able to fill in all these other boxes. So, and to be able to say, yes, there will be a, a, a um, crystal structure forming between these two co-formers or no, there won't. So that's, that's sort of where we are with the, um, the co-crystal work. And I should say, this is only two component systems, of course. These are only binary systems. Um, there is, we've already seen indicator of a, a ternary system uh, that's a, that's a co-crystal. So yeah, it's sort of slightly, slightly um, scary how much there is to do, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Um, I know there are more questions. <laughs> you really want to ask yours, Rob? Well, Do you mind hanging on a little bit longer, Helen? I, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm, I'm in lockdown here in Sydney. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do I speak anywhere? Here? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm Rob Wetton here, <clears throat> NAU. And um, 
I was very interested in your comments on, uh, but I couldn't always tell whether you were using neutron or X-ray. For example, the uh, hexahydrate or octahydrate of sulfuric acid, I believe I, over, I heard you say quite confidently, it's hydronium, and I guess that means bisulfate. Um, and I recall working with a diffraction specialist, another British neutron guy, and looking at the crystallography of that, and he said, you cannot determine from the crystallography that the proton is transferred so that it's really an ionic hydrogen bonded solid versus a neutral. Although chemical and physical guidance would tell you for sure it's an ionic mm -hmm. solid, you know, it's a, pro it's a hydronium. So um, I just thought maybe you could just say, was this a case where you absolutely needed neutrons to find the three protons around the oxygen for the hydronium or, or not? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that. And, and part of that is because I actually use both together a lot of the time. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in the case of the octahydrate, we, we first determined sort of the overall, the heavy atom structure from, sure. the, um, from the synchrotron. And then actually it was my first experiment where I'm currently working now. And I was actually came as a postdoc and it was quite good because I met a lot of people and ended up with a job there. But yeah, so I did um, a, an experiment on echidna with the high resolution um, neutron diffraction that we have here so and and you're right um it is proton positions from powder diffraction can be a little bit um mm -hmm. difficult to determine um, um you can probably see um i can direct you to our have i got the reference to it? the journal of applied um, chemistry paper where we discuss mm -hmm. it quite a lot so yeah in this paper uh, oh no, oh, I haven't got a reference to it. I do, oh no, no, it is in that paper. Sorry, it's not, it's in the Journal of Geophysical Research paper. And uh, we do present both the um, the neutron and the um, X-ray diffraction data and we show the models that fit mm -hmm. both. So it was pretty useful, pretty essential in this case for both the hexahydrate and the octahydrate to have both the neutron and X-ray diffraction to determine that. Yeah, th thanks for pointing out the, the actual paper. We'll look it up. Um, this is actually a question in atmospheric cryo mineralogy, mm -hmm. if you will, because cloud condensation nuclei uh, in the pristine uh, Southern Pacific, like you know, um, are trying to form these, these little uh, crystallites of uh, sulfuric acid and water. And, mm, yeah. um, just yeah. real quick, um, you didn't mention electron diffraction ex except right at the very start, almost to dismiss it. And uh, I wondered if you were aware that um, electron diffraction of jets, of supersonic jets, so forms very nice little microcrystals. Thermometry is a little bit of a challenge, but running an electron beam through a, a jet of microcrystals of molecular and ionic solids, very much like you're showing, is a wonderfully rapid and sensitive way to get a uh, powder pattern which you know, the Riefeld method may or may not be able to. Uh, to uh, and so are you sure there's no competitive activity? Because that would be very- Oh, high. yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm sorry for being dismissive about it. It's, it's, it comes of when you, you, you're you dyed in the wall with using two techniques and you're also an instrument scientist that runs a neutron instrument and you want to keep your, your instrument as relevant as you possibly can. But yes, I mean, the future is incredibly bright with things like the free electron lasers and the and cryo-EM. I've, I've seen some really interesting papers of using cryo-EM, which is more imaging, really, to determine small molecular structures. So um, yeah, I, I, I shouldn't be so dismissive, but I suppose from my point of view, from the sort of mineralogy standpoint, we do want to look at, you know, changing the, the, the great thing about the instruments that I use is we're all about changing the conditions of the material. So it's all very well determining the structures, but also we want to change and see how the, 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 um, the structure responds. And I think with a lot of these new techniques, that's not so clear just yet. As you say, there, there's some temperature control challenges and things like that but uh, yeah certainly down the track right. for sure great talk thanks no worries thanks Thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. since we're still going i'm just going to give jennifer a chance to ask her question and Excellent. then we'll wrap it up at that point no worries <laughs> okay jennifer thanks um so at the beginning you talked a little bit about chlorine salts on europa mm -hmm. and i'm just curious if you've done any work with those um, not a great deal. I did a little bit um, just to look at how they might repair. So there's the, um, 
um, just to look at sort of the um, the, the how the color centers that form in sulfur in in, right. in, in sodium chloride might repair as they um, as they go on as they're um, exposed to sort of more visible light and one of the interesting things it did show that they actually repair quite quickly so I'm not totally convinced on the the explanation of the the, the color centers being the formation of the orange bits on Europa um, mm. Yeah, we have done a little bit of work with some potential ocean, um, ocean, ocean um, um, compositions, and of which um, sodium chloride was a, a, a part of that, and um, and things like hydrohalite and things like that was a crystalline feature. One of the things actually, and and sort of that work got really complicated, and it yeah. we didn't quite get too far with that. The, the one thing we have done a bit recently, and this was with Baptiste Journeau up at um, University of Washington, is that yeah. We, yeah, we've started measuring the density of states of, um, of a lot of these hydrates. So actually hydro highlight was one of the ones we started with because that would enable him to, because he's, he's doing some wonderful calculations of all the thermodynamic properties based on the crystal structures, but he also mm -hmm. needs the density of state measurements in order to, to pin down the thermal contribution. So we've started, and it's been a new world for me doing a bit of inelastic neutron scattering, but it's sort of one of those things that when you have it on site, um, we have, so I've been using our Taipan instrument for that. So I'm hoping that if I get the sort of methodology of that set with some of the hydrates, and they're actually pretty challenging because there's complicated structures, lots oh, of things yes, going I'm on. Aware. <laughs> yeah, so it would mean hopefully that we could then, um, then apply these to other cryominerals as well. Great, yeah. So um, I've done some Europa work too, so we should talk about that more. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Always happy to. Although I, I don't know, there's part of me that went to Titan because I got so so freaked out by hydrates and how complicated they were. <laughs> yeah, they're they're pretty pretty complicated. Yeah. Well, okay. thanks. No thank you for all of the questions. That was great. Um, thank you, Helen. I'm really impressed by how you recovered from such a rocky start. I would not have done that so elegantly. Um, so yeah, thank you one more time, Helen. This was really wonderful and interesting and thought provoking. I'm gonna have to send you some questions offline because we're obviously a little bit over now. Yeah, um, no I would just like to finish by saying we're gonna have another seminar next week. Um, Mariana Potkova is gonna be joining us virtually again, but joining us from the University of Illinois at Chicago. So please join us next week. Thank you again, Helen, and goodbye, everybody. Cool. Thank you, take care, everyone.